We live in exciting times, times like no other. We're on the cusp of the final moments in human history. The days that we live in are witness to the converging of end times prophecy like no other. Now, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and religious leaders for their blindness. Remember, he said, you hypocrites, you can forecast the weather, but you can't read the signs of the times. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. One of the signs of the times that we need to read and look for is the rise of a global empire, a one world government. It's an essential ingredient in the last day's Recipe. It's a main character, you might say, in the last day's scenario. Now, mankind has always wanted to build his own kingdom in the place of God's kingdom. God wanted to rule over the hearts of human beings, but they rebelled from the very get-go. When Noah got off the ark, he and his descendants began to populate the earth again. God said, spread out. Man said, let's stick together. God said, worship me. Man said, worship me. God said, fill the earth. And man said, no, we're going to stay here and build a city. And so they began to build a tower. We read about it in Genesis chapter 11. And in 11.4, the Bible says that these people gathered together sort of to worship around the altar of humanism. And what better place to worship humans than in a city or a government? Mankind always wanted to worship himself. And there's no better place to do that than in government. I found out this the hard way. I went into the government and I realized that they don't want to glorify God there. They want to glorify man. That's the heart of man. He wants to glorify himself. And what better place to do that than to exercise authority of the elite over the sub elite. And so people have always sought to establish their rule and authority over others to dictate life and death and power and the power of taxation and so forth. And so these people gathered together at Babel and they said in Genesis 11:4, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches into heaven so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And so man in his attempt to build his own kingdom sort of built a religion around himself. And around his authority, let's build a tower that reaches into heaven. We'll make a name for ourselves. We'll build a city for ourselves. They wanted their kingdom to be heaven on earth. Mankind has never been able to break back into the Garden of Eden. We've tried. We've tried to build a paradise here. The problem is that our hearts are wicked and we keep killing each other, don't we? And so throughout all of human history, we've been trying to build. Now, God, of course, looked down from heaven. They wanted to build the kingdom of heaven on earth without God. And so the Lord scattered them. You read about it in Genesis 11. He confused their languages. They, they couldn't talk to one another. I just imagine one man said, hey, hand me a hammer. And the other guy said, uh, so yes. And all of a sudden, they couldn't understand each other. And they began to spread out. And, and since then, people have been striving with God. But they've also been striving with one another. Kingdoms, empires, nations, powers, and governments have all come and gone. They're fighting for supremacy, fighting with one another and fighting against God. And if you look out over human history and the governments of man, it looks like a turbulent ocean, just the crashing and the splashing of waves against one another. And the Bible actually likens the nations of the earth. The nations of the world are like the ocean, constantly striving and and in turmoil with one another. We read in Psalm 65, verse seven about the Lord. It says, you who still the noise of the seas, the noise of their waves and the tumult of the nations. And so if you ever drive around Makapu and you see the waves crashing, they're constantly trying to encroach the ebb and the flow of the tide. The Lord says, that's like the nations. They're never resting. They're always striving. They're always fighting. And so we read also in Ezekiel 26, verse three, that Lord says, I will churn up many nations against you like the sea churns up its waves. And so under all this strife and fighting, there is a movement back toward that one world government. The leader of Babel was a man named Nimrod, charismatic. He brought people together. He united them. He was a uniter, not a divider. He would bring people together and they all served there until God scattered them. Now, there are a couple of places that we need to look to in the Bible to understand what what it says about the last day's government, the last day's empire. We need to look in the book of Daniel and we need to look in the book of Revelation. We will start in the book of Daniel, chapter two. In Daniel, chapter two, 
We know that Daniel has been taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. And there the king of the world, Nebuchadnezzar, probably the, the most concentrated power figure we see in history. Nebuchadnezzar ruled the world with perfect authority. And Nebuchadnezzar was a little upset, a little disturbed about the kingdoms that lie ahead, the future of his empire. And as he slept on his bed, he had a dream. And he awoke and knowing that his father's soothsayers and his father's counselors were just hucksters that just made things up. He told them, I've had a dream, guys, and I want you to interpret it. They said, sure thing. Tell us what it is. Because they were good at this. They were, they were fortune tellers. They had things down pat. And Nebuchadnezzar wanted the truth. And he said, you know what, guys? I'm not going to tell you the dream. To prove that you really can do what you say you do, I want you to tell me the dream and then tell me what it means. And they said, well, we can't do that. Tell us the dream and then we'll tell you what it means. He says, I swear, you guys are full of lies. If you don't tell me the dream, I'm going to start killing you. And he had such power that they immediately started to blubber. Well, we can't do... And he said, all right, go kill these guys. And they started slaughtering them one after another. Blood everywhere, heads and arms. And it was just a mess. And they came to Daniel and the other Hebrews that were in sort of the soothsayer school, the school of wisdom. And then when they came to Daniel, probably one of those big burly Babylonian soldiers stood in the doorway and Daniel said, hey, what's going on? Well, I'm sorry, guys, but I I need your heads. Um, And uh, Daniel said, wait, 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 what do you need? And he said, well, this is the story. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, but he won't tell anybody. And Daniel said, why don't you give us just a day? Give us overnight. And we'll see if the God of heaven can reveal this. And indeed, the Lord did reveal it. As they prayed that night, the Lord revealed to Daniel the very thing that the king dreamed. He dreamed about a statue. And in his dream, he looked at this giant statue. And the statue was strange because it was made of different sorts of metal. The head was made of gold. And then as it went down, the neck changed from gold into silver. And this beautiful statue, the arms were made and the chest made of silver. Beautiful metal, not as precious as gold, but probably a little stronger. Then as the dream went on, the chest or the lower chest and the belly was made of brass, cheaper than silver, but stronger nonetheless. And then as the dream went on, the legs were made of iron, just strong as anything, not worth much, but powerful. And then as Nebuchadnezzar dreamed, he saw that the feet were made of iron and but they were mixed with clay, like ceramic clay. And as Nebuchadnezzar was looking at this beautiful image, this statue made of all these precious metals, out of the sky, this sort of meteor came flying down. It was a stone cut out of a mountain, just, and it was thrown down, and it smashed the feet. And the feet came crashing apart. And then the, the legs broke down, and it just sort of collapsed, and all these metals broke apart, and the wind blew them away, and they disappeared. And the stone that was cut out of the mountain without hands, the Bible says, began to grow into a giant mountain, and it filled the earth. Now, Daniel recognized that this was the dream that the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar. And so he goes in the next day, and he's going to tell Nebuchadnezzar what the dream meant. And so we read in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel's explaining the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. I can imagine his jaw is falling further and further as Daniel describes this dream in detail, the dream that troubled Nebuchadnezzar. And he comes to the close. In verse 34, he says, You watched while a stone was cut without hands, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were crushed together and became like chaff. From the summer threshing floors, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. That's a crucial term in your Bible, that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, this is the dream. And now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. Nebuchadnezzar actually ruled over many kingdoms. He was the king of many kings. And Daniel says in verse 37, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand that has made you a ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar must have been pretty happy by now. He thought, man, this is great. I'm the head, I'm the top, and I'm the most precious metal. And Daniel just said some pretty nice things to him about him ruling over different kings, ruling over the children of men, ruling over the beasts of the earth. But then Daniel goes on and he says in verse 39 something Nebuchadnezzar didn't appreciate. 
He says in verse 39, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Oh, it wasn't much consolation. The fact that the other kingdom was inferior wasn't the problem. The problem for Nebuchadnezzar was another kingdom beside mine. Well, that was the arms of silver. And then he goes on and he says, and then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Now, what would happen later on in history over the next couple hundred years, Daniel didn't uh, see this in his lifetime. He saw some of it, but not all of it. But after the Babylonian Empire, you can see in history that another empire came and it was actually two pieces, sort of like a like two arms of silver. It was the Medes and the Persians. And they actually rose later and the Medes were strong at first, but then the Persians sort of overthrew them and they were so numerous. I mean, they were just huge. And so the Persian Empire arose, originally called the Medo-Persian Empire. That was the second nation, the arms of silver. And then there was a third nation of bronze. Of course, young Alexander, the Macedonian, whose father Philip was king in Macedonia, the nation of Greece. Alexander was amazing. He conquered the whole world by the time he was 30 years old. And he cried as he looked out over the horizon thinking there's no more kingdoms to conquer. And he was an amazing leader of his people, but the kingdom was practically given into his hand. When he finally defeated the Persians, he only had an army of 30,000. And he was so stone drunk that he couldn't even wake up for the battle. By the time he finally did wake up, he stepped out of his tent and the Persians scattered. And they had an army of close to a million men. And so the kingdom was given to Alexander. And so Daniel sees the future of these empires coming in his day. And then he says in verse 40, And the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron now, shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. And so after the Grecian Empire was divided among the four generals of Alexander, remember when he was on his deathbed, one night he came in after partying, he was just 30, 32 years old, and he came home in the rain, soaking wet, completely drunk, and he fell asleep in the cold, and he got up in the morning and he had caught in the sickness that he would die of shortly thereafter. His sons weren't very strong as far as leaders, and so as his generals stood around him saying, Who do you want to give this massive kingdom to? Alexander's, some of his last words were, divide it to the strong. Well, these four generals said, well, I'm the strongest, each one of them. And the Grecian kingdom was broken into four pieces. But following that, of course, the Roman Empire began to trample down the earth with its massive road systems and its sort of beautiful democratic form of government where power was spread. It wasn't concentrated like the gold empire of Nebuchadnezzar. Power was spread, but it gave it so much strength. And, of course, they conquered the earth. And it was at this time that Jesus came the first time. Jesus came the first time, but there will be a final empire. And we read about that in verse 41. Look in your Bibles there, Daniel chapter 2, verse 41. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. Verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. The final world empire will be made up of ten nations that have elements of the Roman Empire, but they're mixed with weaker clay-like nations. Notice verse 43. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, this is a very important verse, they will mingle with the seed of men, that is ethnic groups, different cultures, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in those days, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. And so in the days of this last kingdom that's made up of 10 separate parts, 10 separate domains or 
uh, territories or kings, ten toes, that's the day when the stone that the builders rejected will come out of heaven. Now, somebody's going to say, no, I think that the first coming of Jesus was when the stone came out and the kingdom of God is like a mountain that's growing and growing. I point you back to verse 35. It says there that when the stone comes, it says the wind carries away all other traces of the previous empire, all the the Babylonian, the Persian, the Grecian, the Roman, they will completely disappear from the face of the earth. And that hasn't happened. For 2,000 years, the church has been in existence, but so has Babylon. Babylon is the modern-day country of Iraq. So has Persia. Persia is the modern-day nation of Iran. And they're in the news all the time, aren't they? The Roman Empire fragmented. It's split, but it's still around, and there's vestiges of it all over. And so we notice here in Daniel the feet and the ten toes. And so we learn that the last empire will be a mixture of the iron Roman Empire and weaker clay-like nations. And it says here, because it says that they will mingle in the seed of men, that speaks to the fact that there will be an internal variance within the nation, within the empire. It's many nations, it'll be an empire. There will be a variance like that of iron and clay. They won't mix well. The components will be like oil and water whipped together, but they won't be truly unified. There will be elements of the Roman democracy, those iron legs, merging with sort of tribal, clannish, backwater regimes, clay nations, and they'll form an amalgamated world power. But at its core, it'll have insurmountable ethnic strife and cultural differences, incompatibility. And that's what it means when it says they will mingle in the seed of men. They'll try to connect culturally, ethnically, but they will be unable to do so. They will be uh, unable to assimilate one another. Now, Jesus tells us over in actually three of the Gospels, other things, uh, other portions of Scripture that you should be familiar with to understand the last days are Daniel, Revelation. But then there's the Olivet Discourse. Olivet Discourse, what's that? Well, that's the speech that Jesus gave to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. And so it's called the Olivet Discourse. They were concerned about the last days. They said, what, what's, when's this going to happen? You know, the destruction of the temple. And then the end, past that. And Jesus sat them down, and of course he gave them the scriptures in Matthew 24, Mark chapter 13, and Luke chapter 21. And in that portion of scripture, Jesus actually alludes to this fact that they will mingle in the seed of men, but not adhere. For he says this phrase, which you've heard before, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You've heard that before, haven't you? But did you know that the word nation is the Greek word ethnos? You might translate that phrase, ethnos will rise against ethnos. And so the seed of men, the offspring of human beings in their races, in their clans or in their ethnic groups will fight against one another, but they will be merged. And so in the last days, there will be ethnic strife like never before. But I believe that it also speaks to the fact that within this final world empire, they will be mingling in the seed of men, but they won't be able to be unified truly. Another note on this phrase, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The Hebrew scholar Arnold Fruchtenbaum writes in his book, which I highly recommend, the book Footsteps of the Messiah. He says about this phrase, nation shall rise against nation, something that's very important for us to understand. He says these words, quote, it is necessary to return to the Jewish origin of nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This expression found in Jewish sources is a Hebrew idiom for a world war. What Jesus was saying then is that it would be a world war rather than local wars that would mark the beginning of the end of the age. And so World War I took place about 100 years ago. Now, that's not the end. Jesus said, this is not yet the end, but it marks for us the beginning of the final countdown, the last days. And so World War I, about 100 years ago, we're going to see all sorts of things that happened in the past century. There's another phrase that Jesus used to point to our day. You'll, you'll hear this phrase that Jesus says, there will be wars and rumors of war. I've often find it curious, that phrase, rumors of war. What does that mean? Well, the word rumor is akoe, which means sound. Akoe is where we get our word acoustic or echo. And it means that there will be noises of war. In other words, there will be threats of war where a king will threaten another nation, but it won't necessarily happen. Or there will be another phrase uh, that you could translate rumors of war is the preaching of war. 
Think about that. Jesus said, people will be preaching war and threatening war like never before, just before the coming of the Son of Man once again. I think it's interesting because we've never seen a time like ours when there have been such open threats and the preaching of terrorism in nations around the world. Seems like a day doesn't go by that Iran doesn't openly call for Israel's destruction. Their leader over there, Ahmadinejad, is telling the world that he's going to wipe Israel off the face of the map. He's going to bomb the United States, that great Satan, with his nuclear arsenal, which he is developing day by day. Nowadays, we call these threats of war or the preaching of war, we call it saber rattling, where you make these big threats, but that was then, and they didn't have the phrase saber rattling, they said rumors of war. It's a subversive tactic. The idea is to strike fear into the hearts of the hearers, and that's exactly what terrorism tries to do. Never before has the world seen the preaching of war or the rumors of war that we've seen in our generation, terrorism. And I believe that the phrase rumors of war describes describes the terrorism of our last days. World War I, World War II, numerous global conflicts, and the rise of terrorism are the real very fulfillment of Jesus' words that nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and that there will be wars and rumors of war just prior to the end. That happened all in the past 100 years. Now, God's going to give Daniel another vision. The king had a dream, and God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to see this dream through the eyes of a man. And people always see their governments as a beautiful thing, a beautiful statue made of precious metals. God says, Daniel, I'm going to give you my perspective on the future governments. And Daniel gets a vision in chapter seven, beginning in verse two. Now, when God gives Daniel the vision, it's not a beautiful statue made of different precious metals. It's a bunch of wild animals. The kingdoms, the empires which are to come are not a beautiful statue made of gold and silver and bronze and iron. They're just ugly, disgusting, wild, primitive animals, which is the way God thinks of human government. You know, that's the way it is so many times. When we do something, we think it's so noble and pristine, and God looks down from heaven and says that is wild, brutal, and primitive. And so Daniel sees the same empires, but with different players. And so he says in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, Behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. And out of the sea, which is the nations of the earth, rises these empires. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from one another. The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. A lion with eagle's wings sounds like a Rolling Stones album, doesn't it? Bridges to Babylon. A lion standing on its hind legs with wings like an eagle, having been given the mind of a man. That was Babylon, of course. And it was lifted up from the earth to stand on its two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Probably referred to Nebuchadnezzar because he was converted later on in his life. And suddenly, suddenly, verse 5, another beast, a second, like a bear. Boy, the Babylonian empire was like a lion, powerful and swift, wings like an eagle. But then after that came this giant, lumbering, clumsy bear that just crushed everything. It was the Persian Empire. And suddenly, the kingdom of Babylon Babylon was overthrown. It was actually overthrown in one night. King Darius took over. The king, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, a man by the name of Belshazzar, was drunk as he was partying, and the entire army of the Persians marched into the city. Nobody even knew it. They killed the king, and they took over. People didn't even know that Babylon had fallen for an entire week. And the Persians suddenly took over. They were like a bear. It was raised up on one side. That is, it started with the Medes stronger, raised up on one side, and later the Persians would take over. It had three ribs in its mouth. Persia conquered in three different directions. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. In other words, this empire would conquer and devour much area. And so the Persian empire was massive. It was huge. After this, I looked and there was another Like a leopard, leopards are quick. This one actually had four wings on its back. So it's not only quick, it's supercharged. This was the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. I looked, there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. And the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. 
And so it was a quick empire, and it was later divided into four different kingdoms under the different uh, generals of Alexander the Great. Now, after this, this is what we want to look at. Verse 7, I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. There's the iron legs. And it was devouring, breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with his feet. Now, it was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. So there are the elements that we see in the toes of iron and clay. Ten horns, ten kingdoms. Look over in verse 23 and 24. The interpretation was coming to Daniel through the Lord, and it said in verse 23, he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And so, let's turn over in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. God gave Daniel this interesting revelation about this beast, but it was so far off. You know, how could he imagine what it would be like? How could he possibly fathom? Well, John the Apostle would live and write about 700 years after Daniel. And he lived during the days of the Iron Legs, the Roman Empire. He was actually almost killed by the Romans. And so he wrote in chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, Then I stood on the sand of the sea. Again, that element of the sea. Remember that in Bible prophecy, the sea always speaks of the Gentile nations. And I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, and it had seven heads and ten horns. And on its horns, ten crowns. So these are ten kings, ten kingdoms, or ten dominions. And on his heads, a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw, look at this. It was like a leopard. Its feet were like the feet of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Now these are the elements of the previous kingdoms, aren't they? There's a little bit of Babylon in there. A little bit of Persia, a little bit of the Macedonian Empire. It says the dragon or Satan gave him his power, his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. Bible scholars believe that this speaks of the Antichrist who will have been uh, suffered under uh, an attempted assassination on him, and yet he'll come back to life. People will be amazed. It says all the world marveled and followed the beast. The beast speaks of this final empire and more particularly the final world leader who we'll study next week as we look at the Antichrist. And verse 4 says, So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. This is that empire. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? And so here we have this picture of this incredibly strong empire that's actually a warmongering empire. And notice the previous empires that are there. Babylon is actually modern-day Iraq. You know, Saddam Hussein, about 15 years ago, tried to rebuild the city of Babylon, and he stamped them with his name. He rebuilt the city, and it's there today. Persia is the modern-day nation of Iran under that psychopath leader, Ahmadinejad. Of course, the Shah was overthrown back, I believe, about 20, 30 years ago, and they were taken over by religious fundamentalists, Muslims, that actually believe the entire world will be thrown into chaos before the coming of the 12th Imam, their picture of a Messiah. And then, of course, you have Greece, Macedonia, which conquered much of the area of Turkey to this day. So these are the elements. And so we know that in the last days there will be a culmination, a reconversions of governments into one power. There are elements of the past, but we can safely say that there will be ten distinct divisions corresponding to the ten toes and ten horns. Rome was never defeated. Rome sort of splintered. It faded out of fashion. It evolved into the Byzantine Empire after them. And then it gave way to these Muslim and Arab powers that ruled in the sandy deserts over the next few centuries. Muslim aggressors occupied the haunts of the old world while the vestiges of Rome fragmented and fought for survival. The sultans arose. Saladin ruled. Power changed hands. Arabs, crusaders, Moors, Goths, Turks, and others pecked away at the Roman Empire. Muslim rule settled in under the emirs, the sultans, and the imams, under the empire known as the caliphate. And then about the 13th century, the Ottoman Empire arose, a whole empire based on putting your feet up. It's amazing. I'm just kidding. 
But the Ottoman Empire was sort of a Turkish Muslim rule, the clay nations. And they would rule for about six centuries. It was uh, an interesting rule, but they peaked their power in the 17th century. This is important for us because in the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire peaked and then something amazing took place. Something amazing in history took place around the 1700s, 16, 1700s. The, the former Roman powers of the West resurged while the Muslim powers of the East declined. European colonialism or imperialism exploded like one could hardly imagine. And the Arab powers waned. England, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, Austria, and others literally claimed territory as their own all over the world. It was as if the old Roman Empire had resurrected. It was incredible. And by the 20th century, these rising powers collided in the First World War, World War I. It was Germany allied with Austria-Hungary, and who else? The Ottoman Empire. And they were defeated. What happened after they were defeated? Well, the League of Nations was formed, the Treaty of Versailles was signed, and the job of the League of Nations was to prevent further conflict, and what they did was remarkable because they took the old Ottoman Empire and they divided it up into new countries, different countries. And they actually put some heavy tolls upon Germany. Germany wasn't happy either. And Versailles actually read to the rise of fascism and Hitler's Nazi party. The League of Nations hoped for world peace was a bust. And the world, before it had forgotten what they called the war to end all wars, World War I, Hitler's panzers rolled into Poland. World War II began. It was a huge war. It lasted for a long time. The Axis powers under Hitler were defeated once again in that bloody period of time. And the United Nations emerged in 1945 to replace the League of Nations. Same group, different name. New maps were drawn and new countries were formed. The state of Israel was miraculously born into existence in 1948 through the UN. Partly in response to the atrocities of the Holocaust, this last generous act of the UN toward Israel took place. I think it's a twist of divine irony that after the Jews were granted a national homeland, the UN turned on them and has become increasingly hostile toward Israel and grossly anti-Semitic. The actions of the League of Nations mandate and what we know as the United Nations Trust Territories made lines that were literally drawn in the sand and created countries where only regions existed before. Pay very close attention to this. Because something happened in the past 100 years after World War I, which Jesus said would mark the beginning of the end, that has never happened before and is a very real description of the toes of iron and clay. The former Roman Empire nations of England, of Germany, of France, of Russia, all of these nations, peace was made through the Treaty of Versailles and later through the United Nations. And what they did in the former Ottoman Empire was to draw lines in the sand and create countries that never existed before. They were artificial lines and they didn't take into account the ethnic differences between locals. The United Arab Emirates, anybody knows that the situation in Iraq is exacerbated because there are all these different cultural ethnic groups. There are Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds and Persians and Arabs and Jews. Nobody can get along with one another. Mingling in the seat of men, they will not adhere, the Bible says. And so what happened is, is these countries were formed literally overnight. In the last 100 years, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Sudan, Qatar, Kuwait, Jordan, Tunisia, Algeria, and even Egypt. Though these cultures went back a long time, the lines were drawn by the Allied forces in the sand, and they were officially declared countries within the past hundred years. Do you realize what this means? The toes of iron and clay literally emerged in our lifetime. The result has been strife, and we would expect that where assorted clans are coupled with various ethnic groups. It's been the source of turmoil over the last number of decades in that area. But the point here is that for the first time in history, artificial lines were drawn by the remnant Roman Empire over the clay-like Arab region of the Middle East and mingling in the seed of men, they did not adhere to one another. So we can see right now in our day and age, the rise of a world power with inherent strength and brittleness like the toes of iron and clay. There is a concerted effort 
for the ascendancy of a global power. The world is ready and trying to build a new tower of Babel to reach the world. Old Rome is extending its new grip. There's a scripture in the book of Revelation. John is told to measure the temple. But God says, don't measure the court because it is given to the nations to trample underfoot until the time of the end. The nations, the United Nations. That was the plan of Bill Clinton. To allow peace to reign in Jerusalem, this fulcrum, this hotbed of fighting, let's allow the United Nations to rule the Temple Mount. I think that's probably going to happen in the end. But who could have imagined, I mean, 2,000 years later, that somebody would actually propose an implementation of a plan that would fit right in the biblical revelation. So, we have some interesting things happening today. Vladimir Putin in Russia is consolidating power by seizing vast oil fields, natural gas. Remember the election in Ukraine where the pro-Western candidate was poisoned and the pro-Russian candidate won the election under very scurrilous circumstances. The people revolted. They had what was known as the Orange Revolution. I wore orange for the sake of freedom as well. And they demanded to hold elections again. Russia threatened that if the pro-Western candidate was elected, they would cut off the gas supply, which Russia provides 90% of the natural gas through the country of Ukraine. Putin has been seizing oil fields, taking them from Western powers. In the past decade, he's seizing power like never before. In addition to that, Russia refuses to issue sanctions against Iran for some strange reason. Putin and Ahmadinejad find themselves together in some awkward, strange bedfellows situation working together. Now, you could not get a more perfect description of iron and clay mixing together. The former communist Soviet Union, the Tsars of Russia, same word as Caesars of Rome, the Kaisers of Germany, same word as the Caesars of Rome, now working together together with these backwater nations like Persia, clay nations. It's amazing to see what's happening. In the next 20 years, Muslim population in Europe will rise to 65 million. They have a birth rate of three times the average Westerner. We're seeing it in the elections of Germany, France, Ukraine, Poland. People are electing more conservative politicians, partly in response to the threat of jihad and terrorism. Along with the aligning of national powers, there has been a convergence of financial and banking authority over the last century, the last hundred years. It's part of a global government and a single economic market. Just before World War II was over, Just before it finished, over 730 delegates from 44 allied nations met in a hotel in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. They ratified a plan for an international monetary system. And the Bretton Woods Agreement created what we know as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. And these work to this day with the European Union and others for harmony between monetary currencies and the growth of a single financial world market. Right around this time, about 10 years later actually, in 1954, a group of influential people in business, banking, media, and politics met at the Bilderberg Hotel in the Netherlands. Their purpose was to discuss foreign relations and form a steering committee for unity, strength, and peace between Europe and North America. Now, you've got to realize the world was scarred by war, and everybody wanted to get together and make peace. Let's all become friends lest we, we fight again. I mean, millions and millions of people died, and so they met at this hotel, and they're known as the Bilderberg Group. They continue to meet to this day, and they discuss the future direction of Europe and America. The Bilderbergers, and my wife still says that that would be a great name for a hamburger restaurant, build your own burger, Bilderbergers, They nurtured what was called the Treaty of Rome. Treaty of Rome was signed in 1957. Treaty of Rome, why do they, Rome, come on, where's Rome coming from? Well, it was in Rome. And as they signed the Treaty of Rome, it actually formed the European Economic Community. Later, they dropped one of the E's, and it's just the EC, the European Community. Now, one of the men involved in that, David Rockefeller, wanted to include Asia as well. And so in his Bilderberger meeting, he said, hey, let's include Europe, North America, and Asia. 
They said, nah, we don't think so. So he formed another commission known as the Trilateral Commission. Three nations, three groups, or three regions, rather. 350 members, they're power brokers of North America, Asia, and Europe. In 1992, the EC became part of the European Union, known in uh, uh, the Maastricht Treaty, was signed in 1992, and the European Union was born. This was 15 years ago. The European Union. Uh, in 2002, the European Union introduced the euro currency, coins and banknotes, issued from a central bank in Europe. The euro has skyrocketed in, in value. You know this. It's outpaced the U.S. dollar. The euro is used by or affects half a billion people worldwide, and there's more euro currency in the world than United States dollars. Rome is back. Rome is back. Another group that was formed in 1947, I'm just going to give you a number of these. There's no test after the words, so don't, don't worry. You're not going to be quizzed on this. But realize this, that in 1947, in the wake of World War II, as the world sought to unify desperately, rebuild the Tower of Babel, another group was formed called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Actually, it was an agreement called the GATT Agreement by way of acronym. It was formed in 1947, but then in 1995, it was reformed and renamed the World Trade Organization. It has 150 member nation, and it seeks to lower trades, trade barriers globally. Uh, NAFTA was one of those, North American Free Trade Agreement, in order to stimulate growth, in order to foster free trade. Now, there's been a lot of consternation over the World Trade Organization because the highest ranking that you can have as a nation is the, the level of most favored nation. And the WTO has given China this status, and China has a very poor record of human rights and religious liberty. But you see, nothing stands in the way of, of, of progress. Nothing stands in the way of unity. And so all of these things have begun to coalesce. Now, you know that the United Nations was formed in 1945. So you've got all these financial groups, these organizations. You have the World Trade Association. You have the Bilderbergers. You have the Trilateral Agreement or the Trilateral Commission. A number of others. I'm not even going to go into it. You can, uh, you can look it up on the Internet. They're all connected. But in 1945, the United Nations was formed. And its whole goal was to facilitate cooperation between countries in the area of international law, security, economic development, and human rights. And as a questionable track record, I'm not a big fan of the United Nations. Um, and yet, they're a force to be reckoned with. Uh, they now have 192 member states. But I thought there were supposed to be 10. As students of prophecy, we're looking for 10 powers joined together. In 1968, another organization was formed. It was called the Club of Rome. Interesting group. The Club of Rome is sort of an egalitarian group aimed at unity and solidarity in Europe. The Club of Rome hopes to unify the entire globe. And they have a report entitled Regionalized and Adaptive Model for Global World System. It actually divides the world, the entire globe, into ten political economic regions. Their stated goal is a one-world government and a new world order. The Club of Rome was formed in 1968. It didn't make it on the map until 1972. It had a publication called Limits to Growth. It was sort of an environmental treaties that uh, would limit growth of developed nations. Uh, independent countries that are strong are a real hindrance to globalism, so much so that the environmental movement was aimed at undermining the United States. A word about the global warming issue. First of all, I realize that there are people from different political cloths represented here today. This is a fact. A thousand years ago, it was warmer on planet Earth than it is today. Undisputable. The Middle Ages were warmer than it is now. 800 years ago, temperatures were higher in what was called the medieval warm period. Over the next few centuries, it got colder. 400 years ago, we experienced something called the Little Ice Age, when temperatures were much colder than it is today. And then over the last 100 years, the earth has warmed, but not because of human activity. It's because of the sun. How do we know this? Well, the polar ice caps on Mars are melting, and they have no SUVs there. Imagine that. Imagine that. See... The increase of carbon dioxide on Earth is not causative, as Al Gore would have you believe, but is the result of the increased activity of the sun. By the way, the greatest contributor of greenhouse gas or hot air on the Earth is Al Gore. 
That's not true. It's the ocean. Just, just the facts. People, please, just the facts. The hotter the sun is, the more greenhouse gas is emitted by the ocean. And so the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere is a result of a sun that's increasing in activity. There were times in the Earth's history when the carbon dioxide level, CO2, greenhouse gases, were ten times what they are today. And so don't let anybody tell you that your car is causing global warming. Humans have no ability. The inconvenient truth for religious environmentalists is that humans are insignificant when it comes to climate change. Here's something funny. Of all the carbon dioxide that's released into the atmosphere, humans contribute only 12%. Animals contribute 14%. The activists are hoping to change the diets of livestock to curb what they feel is global warming flatulence. And I am not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. They really believe the farts of cows are driving this earth into a terrible state. Read about it in the newspaper. Leonardo DiCaprio wants you all to believe that we have dire consequences. The human race will become extinct on the earth if we don't start riding mopeds. They want to stop and change the diets of cows and horses. Professing to be wise, they became fools. That would be ironic, wouldn't it? If the environmentalists all over the world said, we need to start eating cows. Eat hamburgers to save the environment. No, of course not. It's a religion is what it is. It worships Mother Earth, Gaia, in their mind, but that's another story altogether. Climate control was actually born as a catalyst by the Club of Rome for global unity. It grew into a political campaign and then became an ideological bandwagon whose primary goal, whose primary goal is to weaken the United States. That's right. The United States stands in the way just by being an independent nation. I'm not hailing the praises of the United States. I'm just saying that as an independent nation, it stands in the way of global unity because everything's supposed to be centralized in Europe in the end. And the whole Kyoto Protocol that Bush wouldn't sign, the reason he wouldn't sign it is not because the world is not getting warmer, because it is. But it's not human beings that are causing it. It's just a fact. The reason is because Kyoto calls for the punishment of the United States with heavy penalties for emissions, but it exempts China, which will have more emissions than the U.S. in two years. It exempts them completely. It exempts Brazil and India and other nations that are pumping CO2 in the environment. But that's not really even the issue as far as a scientific standpoint goes. In effect, what would happen is the United States would become the primary financial support for the United Nations. The United Nations would collect billions of dollars in fines from the United States while exempting all these other developing nations, essentially crippling our economy, weakening our autonomy, and paving the way for a last day's scenario where the United States' role is more of a supporting role than a dominant role. We don't take a lead role in the last days. And so the global warming issue actually dates back to the early 70s when the Club of Rome published its book, Limits to Growth. Now, we're looking for 10, aren't we? We're ready to close here. In 1965, a group of six countries joined together to discuss mutual financial policies and shared economic goals. Their hopes were to avoid crisis in economic mar markets. Represented there were France, Germany, Italy, Japan, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Later, Russia and Canada would join. Now this group is known as the Group of Eight, G8. They meet every year. They have summit meetings, and they're met with fierce protest and hostility from anti-globalization activists. Together, this Group of Eight makes up 65% of the world economy, but that's probably a low estimate, and here's why. Because also represented there is a ninth. It's a representative from the European Union, which is not an official member. But the European Union is bigger than the United States. Population of 313 million, billions of dollar more euro in the economy than dollars. And so actually it's a giant percentage of the world's uh, economy. And yet there's pressure to add a tenth nation, China, because China is growing so rapidly. I don't know if this is the case. It's very difficult to make predictions, but it looks like in the very near future there will be 10 economic groups represented. It won't be called the G8. It won't be called the G9. It will be called the G10. And it may be very well that that will be the final world emperor. I don't know.
At any rate, the Gulf War of 1991, after that happened, President George Bush, in a nationwide address, said these words. It was a strange omen over the course of the next number of decades. In 1991, George H.W. Bush said this, This is a historic moment. We have in the past year made great progress in ending a long era of the Cold War. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of the nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at the new world order, an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN founders. George Bush Sr. actually used this term, New World Order, over 200 times in his speeches. My friends, Rome is back and in force. And out of this, the Bible says, one solitary leader will rise. We can go on and on about the massive thrust toward globalization in these last days, but the Bible makes it abundantly clear that in the end, there will be a group of ten kingdoms or dominions which will unite to control the earth politically and economically. One other thing, there will be a single economic market in the world today. In Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel is told these words, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. It was a strange thing to say, Daniel. Daniel, you're not going to understand this until the time of the end when many will go to and fro on the earth is the understanding and knowledge will increase. The idea is that people will go back and forth on the earth, on the planet. That was strange. That was written in a day of chariots and scrolls. 2,500 years ago, it was the same. It was an agrarian society when the only horsepower you had was one. Nobody had 5,000 horsepower under the hood. You got around at the speed of horse. That was it. Or the speed of wind. And yet, the Bible says people will travel to and fro on the earth. And knowledge will increase. The scientist Isaac Newton thought this was fascinating. He conjectured that because the Bible said this, that people will go back and forth on the earth, that somehow mankind would have to invent a way to travel at least 50 miles an hour. This is in a day and age when only horses took you around. Of course, the famous French critic, and I always find this funny, Voltaire, was such a hostile critic of the Bible. He mocked Sir Isaac Newton and said, you poor crazy old man thinking we're going to travel at 50 miles an hour. Everybody knows if you travel over 35 miles an hour, your heart will explode. What if you could go back in time and tell Voltaire that the land speed record now is 763 miles an hour or that people travel at 17,500 miles an hour when they come in on the space shuttle? People will travel to and fro on the earth. How about these new Airbus A380s? Heard about these planes? They can carry up to 850 people traveling at 570 miles an hour. It's amazing, isn't it? People are going to and fro on the earth, just like Daniel said 2,500 years ago. Knowledge has increased exponentially in our day and age. I mean, do you remember when 64 megs of RAM was enough? Do you remember that? When you ran one program on DOS? At a time, it's unprecedented, but the Bible said it would happen at the end. Who could have imagined, who could have predicted the surge of knowledge and information technology that we've seen? Nobody, but the Bible did. And the reason that it's important is found in Revelation chapter 13. The last scripture that we'll look at. Knowledge will increase in the last days, and it has made this verse possible, which was never possible before our day and age. Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 through 18. We read this about this final beast, the Antichrist. He causes all, both small, great, rich, and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. Now, we're going to look at this next week. But suffice it to say that the whole world will be unified in one economy. Every citizen will be tracked by an identification or a mark on their body, which enables them to buy or sell, to live and do business. The concept alone was unthinkable when when John wrote it. It was ridiculous. You couldn't even fathom the whole world. You've never been to the other side of the planet. Most of you have been all over the earth. 
And to think that everybody could be tracked in a single economy? Don't be ridiculous, John. But now, it's not only feasible, but it's probable. In the middle of all this, this emerging of globalism, a single economic market, converging governments, and the currency and language gaps being bridged all over the world, a pressing need for unity, the charismatic Nimrod will arise again, the Antichrist. He'll be the quintessential leader, the ultimate governing machine. To the world, it'll be wonderful. It'll be the pinnacle of government, the image of Nebuchadnezzar, which he made for the whole earth to bow down and worship. And everybody did, except the Jews, remember that. It'll be a new Tower of Babel, a new Babylon, a new Roman Empire, and it'll represent mankind's last chance for the future. He'll offer peace. He'll offer security in a time of terror and fear. He'll offer hope for mankind to a lost world, but it'll be a false hope and a false peace because he'll be a false Christ, the Antichrist. Now, you say, well, bud, thanks for all that history, but how does it apply to my life? I mean, good goodness sake. Should I protest the World Trade Organization? Should I wear a black shirt on my head and break windows and, and uh, go out and stand against the World Bank? Should I be an anarchist, stockpile weapons in a cave up in the mountains, take food up there and water and fight the power? No, you shouldn't. Should I get into conspiracies and decode every single enigma on a dollar bill, expose the Illuminati? Should you do that? No, that's not... I can make George Washington's head into a mushroom on a dollar bill, but... But there are things about, you know, you could get so lost in that stuff, and that's not what the Bible wants you to do. I would tell you to do three things. First of all, hang on to Jesus. You better get serious about your Christian walk, because the time of the end is closer than you imagined. Don't mess around with things that are going to hold you back. Quit dabbling with the world and wandering around in a spiritual wilderness. Lock onto the Bible like never before and give yourself totally to Jesus like you never have before. From this day forward, get serious about your walk with Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Hold on to Jesus, number one. Secondly, let go of the world. This world is passing away. It's going to burn up. Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard gave an illustration of a theater that was showing a variety show. It was a huge success. Each scene came and the audience cheered more wildly one after another. And finally, the manager steps on the stages, stage and he apologizes for the interruption. And he says that the theater is on fire and everybody needs to evacuate. But the audience thinks that's part of the show. And they just cheer and they applaud. And the manager, again, he begs them to leave. I'm sorry, he says, but everybody has to get out in an orderly way. And they applaud again and again. Finally, the smoke and the flames are rising behind him, and he has to run out. And the, the crowd begins to laugh and to cheer wildly. And the whole place is burning down. The theater and the audience are finally consumed as they're cheering and applauding. They think it's a great show until they're burned up. Soren Kierkegaard concluded with these words, Our age will go down in a fiery destruction to the applause of a crowded house of cheering spectators. Let go of the world. It's going to burn up. Let go of it. And don't be upset by the problems that you face. Realize that this world is the end. I mean, there is a, a global movement toward a government where everybody's devotion will be focused on. God Almighty is preparing to come back to the earth. And our biggest worry is, do you need room for cream? Right? Hey, let me encourage you. Let go of the world. Quit stressing out about that money. Start focusing in on what's important. Don't let the world hold you down or get you down. Realize this, that God is in control. And when you're hanging on to Jesus, you can let go of the world. And finally... I want you to remember this, that God's put you on this earth for a purpose. For a purpose. What is it? Well, I often think that it would have been easier to live in a different time. Because I look at the world through the filter and the lens of biblical prophecy. And it can be troubling. The world is moving toward a rapid end. And I wonder, Lord, wouldn't it have been better to live in the 1800s where everything was a lot better? But then I realized that God didn't put me in the 1800s. I realize that God put me in this time and he put me in this time for a purpose. God has put us here now for a purpose to live in this earth in these times. And the sign of the end is looming overhead. There's a story in the Bible about a Jewish woman, Esther. She was taken captive during the era of the Persian Empire. Remember Esther? She's a beautiful woman. God used her beauty. She was actually taken into the harem of the king. And that was a place of safety for her. 
It meant opulence, luxury, and blessing. But there was, however, a plot against the Jews. A man named Haman, sort of an old school Hitler. He wanted to kill all the Jews. And Esther found out about it. And she wanted to get help for her people from the king. And yet, to approach the king without permission could jeopardize her life. If he didn't offer the salutary greeting as she stepped into the court, she would lose her head. Pretty head that it was. She would have died. And she was afraid. She would jeopardize her life. So her uncle Mordecai comes and he says to her, Esther, let me read it for you, Esther 4.4, if you remain silent at this time, Mordecai would say, relief is going to arise for the Jews from another place. But you're going to die. You and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. For such a time as this. And that's what I want to leave you with. That we've been placed on earth for such a time as this. We live in exciting days. We live in opulence, luxury, and blessing. But I believe God has called us to risk it all for one purpose, just like Esther, to save souls. It means we have to put our lives on the line. We need to pray like never before, worship like never before, give like never before, live like never before, and maybe even die. Ultimately, we have to do exactly what Esther did and stand before the king on behalf of lost souls. Esther stood before Ahasuerus, but we stand before Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. There are millions of people out there who don't know the Lord. They've never heard his voice. They've never heard his name. There are millions more who have heard his name, but they don't know him. They have no hope in this world. Your job is to reach them. Let me close with this scripture from Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Amen.